Dalia, thanks for coming. Um, today we have Erin Guan. Um, she is a she's recently joined our institute ABI, but um, she did her BE and BSc conjoint at the University of Auckland here, majoring in biomedical engineering and physics and chemistry. So she covered pretty much like 75% of all science and engineering. And then she, after BE, she started working on forensic modeling project, first as a master degree in mechanical engineering, um, or also at the University of Auckland, and then continued on to a PhD. Um, so Erin is at the moment working on our TBI project as well, so she's covering uh, like a whole spectrum of brain injury from mild traumatic brain injury all, all the way to this um, very severe uh, ballistic injury as well. So today we'll get to see all the flavor of brain injuries here. So all the way for you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, it is very nice to come back here into this building. But according to the ABI poster, I never left. <laughs> because that's me. That's my research. <laughs> So I was secretly a spy for this, but um, most of my work was done in mechanical engineering because they have wonderful workshop, which I will show you some of the results. Um, so let's get started with a short clip of my motivation for this research. <laughs> um, as you can see, no human was harmed in making of that clip. Um, you can see that making of a virtual crime scene is all the rages, especially from the CSI kind of a TV shows. However, this is a very helpful tool in a jury um, crime conviction and stuff because the court is not all composed of scientifically based juries. So forensic science has an inherent problem of doing an accurate crime scene reconstruction of the events that happened without knowing what actually happened. And sometimes the people who are supposed to tell you what happened are not really alive. Um, objectivity, that your um, story or whatever has to be stand um, alone scientific at court and everybody has to be able to question it and you have to be able to defend your theory. Lastly, the visualization is a very powerful tool when it comes to a lay person presentation. So I wanted to make a good model for forensic science. For now, in terms of blood scatter evidence, you will see something like this, lots of strings hanging from all around the walls and stuff. This is actually scientifically accurate. I've been to a workshop and seen like how these are done. However, this takes a lot of effort in crime scene reconstruction. Imagine attaching every single string to like a single droplet of things. Uh, takes hours, if not days. Objectivity is of a question because depending on the analyst, you will get slightly different results. It's almost verging onto an art rather than science. But visualization-wise, this is still a very strong tool. The current development in crime scene reconstruction is to use augmented reality, which helps the objectivity and ease the pain of crime scene reconstruction. So a good model that I'm trying to reconstruct um, answers all the forensic problems, will have good biofidelity, as well as accessible. If your model is not readily accessible, um, you can't use it. And good preservation in terms of crime scene geometry, and the evidence. Why am I concerned about crime scene conservation and evidence? Because if you run a DNA test, every time you run a test, you use up the evidence. So you have to think about conservation of those things as well. Also has to be adaptable because no two cases are identical. And cost effectiveness and efficiency is an obvious requirement. So. I can't construct a whole body model for everything, so I had to narrow it down first. So I was interested in blood spatter evidence, and to be more specific, something called back spatter. <coughs> so when you see movies 
and you get a headshot, you see a massive blood spattered to the other side of the shooter. However, there is a small amount of blood spattered backwards towards the shooter, which is called the back spatter. This spatter can land on the shooter, establishing a biological link between the victim and the shooter, which determines the guilt. The absence of it can actually validate whether something was a staged homicide or an actual genuine suicide. So back spatter actually has a huge evidential value but study of it has been limited due to the lack of model. Because in order to research facts better, you have to have a model to recreate it, um, because you really can't experiment with humans. Um, however, due to the high speed nature of this impact, the facts better mechanisms are not 100% validated. So far, the proposed mechanisms of backspatter generations are subcutaneous gas pockets, which happens when you get shot point blank. The exhaust gas um, goes in between the skin and the bone, expands and ejects everything out the other way as well. And something called tail splash, when a bullet enters the body or the target, the material splashes back at the tail of the bullet. And something called temporary cavity collapse, which the temporary cavity is created by bullets passing, collapses, therefore ejects the material out back. So these two are the mechanisms that I was interested in. We didn't try the subcutaneous gas pockets, so I can finish and graduate in time. I'll show you a video illustrating the tail splash and the temporary cavity collapse. So this is the bullet from the left hand side going through a half a head model, which has gelatin brain, a bone layer, and a skin layer. So the material that's spattered right now is the tail splash. And as the brain collapses, you will see the temporary cavity back spatter. So these can travel anywhere up to about a meter or so. And if you were shooting something near that, you might be um, have those little blood droplets that position onto you. So, in terms of modeling, when human is out of question, you have to resort to these three main avenues of modeling, the animal, physical, or computational model. I did some animal modeling, generally to see what's important, what factors influence backspatter generation. Can we use sheep? instead of human? Or does it have to be human? Those are the questions that I've answered using the animal model. So I've harvested 19 sheep heads as part of another research, um, thanks to ligands. These animals were very carefully controlled. And you can actually know how many days they were old and like which lineage they came from. So they were all from the same sp um, species and everything. Um, they were female and male, so I was able to do the um, sex contrast. The variables I recorded, I've used two different bullet types. The 9 mil full metal jacket bullet, which is the standard ammunition for American police, and a .22 caliber long range rifle. Um, obviously the sex, and the head and body weights were also recorded to see if they influenced the ballistic outcome as well. Also, the number of hours between the sacrifice of the animal to the ballistic experiment was measured to see if the time elapsed has some kind of an influence in terms of rigor mortis or anything else. We found that the caliber does have a very distinctive influence. The bigger the caliber, the higher the energy um, delivered by the bullets, obviously you'll get a lot more back better. However, the species actually made a difference. I had access to a pig study that used um, both live and dead pigs and was able to contrast my sheep study with that. Both pig and sheep showed uh, quite a different backspattering behavior in terms of timing of the spatter and the manner. The head size also showed a difference, larger the head size the larger the temporary cavity created, therefore, little more back spatter. Sex was the same thing, because female tends to have a slightly smaller head, therefore, it's kind of 
double correlation with the head size. Another interesting thing was mortality state. A live animal showed a very different result to any of the sacrificed animal in terms of the composition of fat spatter materials. Um, so as part of um, animal model result, we can establish that we need something that is close to human geometry because that is important um, and something that replicates a live person's state. So I started um, constructing a physical model. I started something simple, a box. This box has about a similar volume as average female intracranial volume, filled with gelatin brain, and has bone layer and skin layer at the either end of the cap to simulate a brain um, and taste in a skull. The materials were validated to be similar to biological materials in terms of ballistic behaviors through my master's research. So we're not just going to trust that because I've got the degree. <laughs> um, but this construction allows us to rapidly replace the gelatin brain into the base and replace the caps in order to have a multiple e experiments in one setting. Also, we were able to digitize a whole head of an individual. We had about 100 MRI, and of the MRI, we selected for female and of a certain age uh, based on a statistics that's mostly likely to get shot. So this is the person that we ended up with. Um, the resolution was 0.9 millimeter, which meant 176 slides were used in order to create this model. So you digitize the brain, skull, and the skin layer separate. I didn't go into the levels of like blood vessels and different lobes of the brain, thinking this was um, sufficient. Um, after 3D printing, you get something like that. So these are the actual physical molds for the brain, the skull, and the skin. These will all nest inside each other to create the final model, the sample. The nice thing about casting is you're going to get the same geometry again and again, which kind of solves the repeatability of the sample. So you can see. You can see that there is a wax brain that you cast a skull, and you melt out the wax, you will get an um, internal cavity that's shaped like a brain. And then you cast a skin layer on top of those skulls. And as a final step, you fill the cavity with the gelatin that has been calibrated to be similar to an actual brain. Then you get these samples of heads. So what do you do next when you have samples, as you ship them? I was able to use the firing range in ESR. Um, the sample is set up, secured, and high-speed video is recording the whole <coughs> ballistic event. And we were using 9 mil Glock mainly for this experimental round. We did not use .22 caliber to reduce the number of variables. So, that's the sample, camera, and the gun, if you can't really distinguish it from the background. And I can say it's kind of verging onto like a very human biophilic resemblance. Let's have a look at some of the high-speed um, video results. These were um, filmed at 30,000 frames a second. which I think is a very nice video of showing how the internal brain simulant expands and collapses its temporary cavity. 
the actual physical model, you won't be able to see the internal cavity expanding and collapse due to the opacity of the model. But you can still see the entry and exit and the spatter. One thing I learned from these are I really don't like guns. Yeah. They are very scary. Um, yes, once you shoot them, now is the fun part. You have to validate your model. Is it actually acting like anything like um, literature reported models of other people or something from a case study? So on the right is a model by Fowley et al. Um, they made a skull model based on a CT scan. They shot them and was able to demonstrate the whole evisceration of the top going off and brain jumping out, which I was able to replicate. I think they're a pretty good match. Uh, the next one actually has some case study photos if you're sensitive. These are based on um, autopsy reports. So on the right hand side are the um, actual remains that suffered a ballistic impact. And on the left is my skull model, which shows about the same cracking behavior and wounding sustained. Um, especially of the interest is the beveling behavior. When the bullet enters into the skull and out of the skull, the wound does not go straight through. It goes out at an angle, which you can see. The outer crater here is bigger than the inner crater. I'll talk a little bit more about the beveling later. At this point, I was pretty happy um, qualitatively of my model. So when the bullet goes in, because it pushes into the material at an entry, you get a conical beveling facing inside the brain. However, at the exit, um, you get a much larger exaggerated beveling, much greater than the diameter of the actual bullet. Um, the theory has been proposed that it is because of the pressure wave hitting the bone and helping it create a larger um, wounding area. So this is the actual bullet entrance of my model, which shows you this end of the beveling. And there is an internal beveling going in. And on the exit side of the same sample, you can clearly see the beveling is external and slightly larger than the bullet's caliber. Um, so I was developing a computational model concurrently as well. When I say computational model, a lot of people think of something like this. A finite element model um, encased or divided into meshes of elements and you input the initial conditions and you simulate the, um, what's going to happen potentially from the initial conditions. However, this is not very suitable for ballistic spatter study because finite elements cannot spatter. It's an interconnected mesh. So in order to overcome that, we've used something called smoothed particle hydrodynamics, SPH, which is Instead of a meshes, it has individual particles that are kind of connected together um, using the smoothing function. If an impact that is larger than the strength of the material is um, induced onto these materials, these particles are allowed to break free and become a spatter. So my computational models were supposed to have a matching geometry to the physical model, so they can be validated later. So remember my physical box that had a brain inside and a little cap at the end? That's what the computational geometry looks like for the box. And for the MRI, I just recycled the MRI geometry in order to have an SPH model. Um, the model was at, um, model had a pin boundary condition at the neck, so it was allowed to like move or sway a little as the bullet impacted it. The brain was modeled as a viscoelastic, solid and skull isotropic 
um, elastic failure, so it was allowed to brittly crack and crumble. And then the skin was modeled as a hyperelastic rubber. So to give you an idea of the like, sizes and time consumption of these models, final element is much lighter in terms of CPU hours, and they're very economic. So if I had my particles sized at 2 millimeters, it takes about 47 hours to run. And if you just zone in on and on and on, it just gets ridiculously large in terms of file size and time to solve the model. So instead of like a um, cool ballistic shooting experimental photo, that's all you see for days at an end. So it's not very exciting, I understand. But let's have a look at some of the results in comparison to the physical model that I did. So that's the computational box on the left and the physical box on the right. <coughs> And um, computational model on the right and the physical model on the left. The SPH model was very successful in generating both the back spatter and the forward spatter. But another thing that it was really good at was it was able to replicate the cavity sizes. So you can see the internal cavity that's about a certain diameter. And my SPH model internal cavity diameter kind of matched that of the physical model. Another thing was materials um, resistant to the bullet, the bullet retardation. So as the bullet goes through a physical model, it will slow down as it imparts kinetic energy. This also happened in my computational model. The speed of the bullet passing through the model was well matched compared to the physical model. So I was quite happy. Also, SPH was able to generate beautiful cracks. So you can see this is the front plate of a box model. And on the right, there is an actual physical model. And I don't know if you can see the hairline cracks radiating from the entrance. But in terms of the like, total length of the crack and the radial manner of it, this was a pretty good qualitative match. And other things that was um, a good match was the uh, proportion of the wounding. So on the left, you have a very small entry wound. And on the exit side, the wounding is very large compared to the entry. Um, the model replicated that successfully. In terms of this little retrograde bulging, you actually can see that the dimensions are pretty accurately matched between the physical model and the computational model. Um, I think that, yeah, that's a video. The, another reason why I wanted a box was because I wanted to see what's happening inside, to see whether the timing of the brain temporary cavity collapsing or can be correlated to the back spatter generation, therefore giving you a scientific evidence for the mechanism. And you can actually see that the computational model cavity behavior and the brain box cavity behavior is very well matched as well. So I was, in general, very happy with both the physical and the computational model. Now, a um, few other interesting things is, when you shoot something, can you tell me which side do you think is an entry and which side is the exit? Any try? This side is exit. Yeah. Any reason why you thought that was the exit? Some parts. Push out from this part. So when the bullet enters, it um, breaks up the bone layers, and you can see a lot of material embedded. And as you go through, you lose the particles because they get like embedded into the brain. So this behavior is very clear from my physical model. 
and that's like just from the front view of an entry wound, you can actually see the like bone simulant particles there. And this is my simulation. I turned off the brain and the skin. And you can actually see the bone particle just gets distributed in a similar manner to what you can observe from the physical model. So that's another thing that you can use the model to study some stuff, like how far would a particle can be um, carried on? Can you see it like five centimeters, 10 centimeters into the brain or other things? And back to the bibbling, because I really like this. Um, you can actually see that this yellow layer, the bone, is exhibiting a bibbling behavior. So that's another like um, validation that the my model was actually quite good. Um, for some numbers, I've calculated some average, typical average velocities of the particles ejected um, in terms of backspatter, and you can see the average of the physical model backspatter particle is within the boundaries of the virtual model. So that means the all the kinetic energies and other parameters were realistic as well. If you remember this introduction study, um, I was talking about backspatter mechanisms of tail splash and temporary cavity. You can actually have a proof of tail splash and temporary cavity being the backspatter mechanisms when you have a look at these um, distribution. So these open, um, empty circles are the subcutaneous temporary cavity, the little coning at the entry of the skin um, collapsing. And you can see the primary backspatter are all within that collapsing. There is nothing outside of this time frame. Therefore, this must be the propelling mechanism for this primary backspatter. Um, I also calculated or measured the brain temporary cavity collapsing from my box model and my simulation. Um, and there is a secondary backspatter ejection. Whenever it is observed, it always fell between the collapsing of the brain temporary cavity. So this kind of shows you that these two are definitely one of the backspatter generation mechanisms. Oh, another thing that was um, very visually great was you can explain why the exit wound is greater than the entry wound. So this is a um, stress diagram. So as you can see, the bullet is propagating through the model. You see a little stress wave front. It hits the exit side bone before the bullet hits it, conditioning it. So when the bullet actually contacts it, <coughs> it kind of breaks off and just exaggerates the wounding. You can't really um, do a stress study in terms of physical models, so this is a great way of visualizing what's actually happening. So if you look at the autopsy reports, um, not that I expect any of you to do so, um, there's interesting report when you suffer a lateral gunshot, sometimes there's an uncorrelated cracks that's observed in either eye sockets or under the base of the skull. And people just explain that these are the typical things that you can expect from a gunshot injury to the head. However, the bullet was nowhere near the crack. But the simulation actually can show you that as the bullet goes in, this is from the sagittal section, the midplane, the stress wave travels through the skull first and kind of concentrates in the areas of where the major cracks are found, that the cracks that are not attached to the initial impact site. Um, these are the, like, the side view. As the bullet goes through, you can see the skull stressing. This actually has a, something to do with the crack propagation. The skull crack always run from the entry to the exit, never the other way. Um, so what's so important about that is you can tell the entry from the exit wound by looking at those crack directions. So 
sometimes when you um, suffer multiple blows, it's important where the bullet um, was coming from and to because it's so fragmented. But now you can establish that the crack is running from the entry to the exit all, always because of the running, pre-running stress wave. So um, I did a little bit of a trajectory plotting using the data generated from my simulation. So I've generated the particles of forward and backscattered particles from my simulation. I've exported the location coordinate and the velocity vector and inputted uh, drag, air resistance, and the gravity, which plots a potential trajectory. And you can overlay it onto a geometry of a room or any virtual crime scene or crime scene scans to generate potential areas of interest. This may not be an exact point where you will find something. However, this will give you the proximity of how far you should be expecting if this actually happened. So this can be a very good validation tool of a crime scene reconstruction. So um, did my model satisfy all these initial premises? I think the last trajectory plotting does the job of crime scene reconstruction or of the running the scenarios. Objectivity, yes. Doesn't matter whoever runs these simulations, the results will always be the same. And I think the visualization is excellent. So therefore, it and my model answers all forensic problems, um, has high biofidelity, it's accessible, especially the virtual model, the computational model, you can just access anywhere from the globe through internet. My physical model, you can just ship it to another country in a matter of days and they can set up experiment. Um, both models do not alter the scene or the evidence in any way, so the preservation of both are excellent. The models can be set up in a different ways to impact in any direction because it has actually a true thickness and all the material properties and everything right. So it doesn't really matter whether you impact the brain from the left to the right, underneath, or the top. Cost effectiveness. Mm, it's slightly cheaper than actually purchasing animals and trying to set up an experiment and those things. So you have to trust me that it is slightly cheaper. Uh, efficiency, I think these are far more efficient than trying to attach strings to every individual droplets of a crime scene. So I've just told you a lot about something that you don't know. So I wanted to show where this research is sitting. So this is like 2005 research. That's the physical model that's like the most advanced reported in literature. It's great, um, it's based on CT scans and stuff, but it was constructed in a two part, so whenever you shoot at it, the scene kind of tends to explode first, and I don't know if that's really realistic. Um, and you can see it's lacking skin. I think skin does something to hold everything together, so I think you would like a skin in your model. In terms of um, simulation, nobody did SPH model before, they tried to construct um, FEM models in order to study concussion and um, study how valid a ballistic helmet and other things are. So they're pretty good resolution. However, my model of one millimeter is by far the most like um, fine uh, in terms of particle size or mesh size. So you can see that my results compare quite well to um, current literature. Oh, and after all this, what happens to the research? I was thinking, there's a future application. So first, obviously, you can incorporate this model into some kind of a forensic um, application, uh, but there are many others. Not in this country, but maybe in America. If you survive a headshot, the first thing to do is cut out as much of your brain as possible because tissue necrosis is worse than losing a chunk of your brain. However, if you can use this simulation to 
more accurately refine an area of damage, you might be able to inform the surgeons, no, 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 you don't have to cut the whole chunk out, just cut about this much. Obviously, defense or sports or recreational shooting, you want the defensive gear, and this will be an excellent model to put the gear and test it out physically or in terms of um, computational simulation, which will feed back to governmental regulation being set up. Um, in America, if you want to see, if you want to change your standard ammunition, which one is more safe for human, those things can be conducted using these models. Last but not least, hunting, which is the most humane bullet to kill something, is also a valid question if you're a hunter. So there's uh, opportunities in all those fields if you have your model right. This research wouldn't have happened with um, <coughs> helps from all these people. NASI provided the computing resources. Um, and Department of Engineering Science and ABI obviously um, supported my research through excellent supervision. Uh, Liggins Institute provided animal models, and ESR were the primary source of funding and firing range. And all my physical models were constructed using the Center of Advanced Composite Materials Laboratories. And these are all my acknowledgments. So there's a lot of people involved. But um, this is where my funding primarily came from. They gave funding to ESR, which in turn handed it to me. So the whole thing is sponsored by Americans. Yeah, no wonder why. So I think it's safe to see if you guys have any questions. Questions from the floor? Whoa, a lot. Okay. <laughs> Apart from the lady there. <laughs> when you reconstruct the. Yeah, it's a very interesting talk. <laughs> um, when you reconstruct the crime scene, how do you. Like, is it from photographs or do you have some kind of scanner, 3D scanner for the room or how? So, you mean how does the actual um, when you want to scene investigators mm -hmm. usually do? So. You get to suit up and go out and either do it manually from the crime scene, mm -hmm. which risks destroying the crime scene and the evidence. Mm -hmm. Or nowadays, you can use a 3D scanner. Yeah, okay. so, so you have a scanner that yeah, you put a scanner in the like, middle of the room, it scans the whole like, structure, and obviously you have to supplement the scan. Um, for example, if you're scanning from the center of the room, you will not see the other side of this chair. So they have like kind of a ghostbuster setup where there's like a moving scanner and you have to like handheld scanner up and down, which gives you pretty accurate reconstruction of the crime scene. At the moment, New Zealand um, investigators are working on a virtual crime scene that you just have a, like a uh, warehouse empty space and you wear the goggle and the whole crime scene will be in front of your eyes. Um, I, I'm very much looking forward to that. But does that scan the blocks better? Uh, also, or is that something you have to put into the scan? Afterwards? So you can supplement the scan with a crime scene photos. Uh -huh. And at this stage, I think you have to supplement those details because the resolution of the scanner might not be able to see all those like different um, backgrounds. Mm -hmm. If you have a blood on a black carpet, I don't know if the scanner or even human eyes can see it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um. Thank you very much for the great talk. How uh, did you decide the material property, physical properties of the different components of your physical model? Like is you mentioned viscoelastic model for the skin or hyper for the bone, hyperelastic model for the rubber for the skin. Did you find any literature or did you so test the material properties? Yes, all the values, the model model equation the Constitutive model equation itself was found from literature. Mm -hmm. And for example, for the skin, we tried like the Ogden and Mooney Rivlin and those different models and see which one produced the most matchable result to the physical models. The numbers that you plug into the equation was actually acquired through mechanical testing of the sample materials. But that was not part of this PhD. 
so um, yes, yeah, so I noticed that you uh, the gel that you used to simulate the brain was based on uh, characteristics of the brain tissue and similar with the skin. But the the bone component of your model wasn't was that specifically based on a bone constitutive model, or that was just a that was just like a plastic composite? Um, for the simulation? Uh, yeah, for the physical model. That you oh, did. for the physical model. Yeah. Um, so it was a polyurethane composite with a high density powder to create the right kind of a bubbling and the cracking behavior. So it's a, like a home, um, uh, we developed it, but that was part of somebody else's project. Yeah. And I just poached their result. So, so that was designed sort of heuristically to uh, replicate the, I guess sort of the effects that you'd get from a you know, gunshot impact to bone, but it wasn't explicitly based on bone in, in the, like the way it was designed in the constitute model. So if you made if you did materials testing of the composite and bone, would they be We did not base it on a mechanical testing, yeah. but more of a ballistic results. Right. Yeah. So we were more interested in replicating the size of the bullet wounding of the bone, the artifact size, rather than the matching like Young's modulus and other things. Because we don't know how the material will behave at a ballistic range. Because um, the rate of strain actually like changes your material. So, for example, like the brain will more act more like a solid, but um, we haven't actually characterized the bone or any other material to the extreme of the high um, speed impact. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, I don't know if matching Young's modulus will give us a similar ballistic behavior. Yeah, I was just curious as to in, in what ways that it was designed to, to mm -hmm. resemble bone, because I noticed that the, you know, obviously the impact results are really good. Yeah. So you sort of answered that question already, because you said it was chosen because the impact results yeah. match bone. So um, these are the like things that we measured from a ballistic response, like the retrograde bulging and the size of the cavity and the length of the total cracks and all those things. And those are the what we use to match the best candidate. Mm -hmm. We've tried epoxy, concrete composite, uh, polyurethane, and even a 3D printing material based on calcium that the dentists use. Oh, okay. And we're quite happy with the current um, concoction. <laughs> Thanks. Any other question? Thanks for the talk. It was really interesting topic. Uh, but uh, so, in terms of your uh, computational models, uh, that computational model that you developed, uh, did you take into account uh, the the Coriolis effect of the bullet inside the inside the tissue, or was just what do you mean by Coriolistic? Because the bullet doesn't go like just straight forward. It's sort of like rotating towards the axis. Yeah. And so the, I think it really contributes to the to the like the like forwards pattern, I think, uh, because of uh, I think it's like because you were like interested in the bevel shape uh, from the outside as well. So I think that country was like, did you take that into account as well in your model? That's very good thinking because I had the exact same question after like two years into the PhD. I looked mm -hmm. up. Somebody actually measured how many turns you would do as you progress through the thing. And the number of turns weren't significant enough. Uh, so bullet is not crazily turning as mm -hmm. you go through. It only do like a like a one yeah, revolution it's barely. Traveling really fast. It just yeah. So in terms of a linear and um, radial um, speed, this speed does not go even like anywhere close to the linear speed of like hundreds of meters per mm -hmm. second. Yeah. Oh, thanks. That's a good question, right? <laughs> yeah. Did you add another question? Yeah, I was thinking about the physical model, the one that you nest inside of each other. Oh, yeah. Did you have, uh, like, between the different layers of it, did you have liquid, or was it air, or do they fit, like, perfectly together? So, we had a bit of a generations of models before we actually got to the final model that I showed you. So, where is the slide? Because I'm thinking the brain is, has a lot of cerebrospinal fluid. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. I went very down. Actually, I can't find the slide. Um, cerebral and spinal fluid. Somebody did a study of whether the CSF has a great impact on back spatter generation, and the answer is no. If you fill up the whole cavity with gelatin or have a little bit of a shrinkage and fill it up with the water or um, anything liquid, 
um, they didn't see a huge difference because of the, the magnitude of the impact. Mm. I'm pretty sure that will factor very importantly into a concussion model, something slower or something smaller. But yeah, another master thesis was on it. So yeah. <laughs> Out. Yeah. Each particles will have its own like mass and the direction of um, going out and velocity. Okay. Those were captured at a certain point. So a virtual screen was set up here and right. here. And you just, and you just feed that into a MATLAB and imbue like air drag and gravitation right. and say like where are you going? I think it's a very cute animation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this is just a, like a mock-up crime scene, but mm -hmm. it can be easily overlaid onto any other virtual geometry. So the overall plan is to have that and then your SPA model embedded inside it so that you can yes. generate. Yeah. The SPH models are very computationally expensive. So the end goal is you will have a standard female of 20s, 30s, 40s, and you can just have a, like a database lookup table and then you can just plug it in. But that's more to validate the difference in a story. Somebody can easily say, oh, that guy was attacking me, therefore I shot him. But you can run that scenario, and another scenario of that guy actually not attacking somebody but running away mm -hmm. and looking back. Because just looking at the entry and exit won't doesn't tell you what the exact situation was. And this might be able to discern the differences or something that's not matching up with the um, person's story. Great. OK, so if there's no further question, let's thank Erin again for a great talk. And I'm <laughs> so let's continue our conversation over here. Thank you.